Hey everyone, welcome to episode 2 of the High Ganya Spice full series analysis. In this video, we cover far more episodes up to from 3 to 6, I believe. And this is because most of these episodes are straight up filler. Every episode is contrived to the highest degree. We'll run through the episodes first, and then at the very end, we'll do a retrospective on all the episodes, and I'll explain to you why exactly High Guardian Spice is contrived. Filled to the brim with some of the most laziest writing I've ever seen. Trust me, there's worse. By far, this is really bad. So if you haven't already, check out the first episode. I'm surprised anyone watched that at all. It's literally my first video, so I'm a bit like, wow. I'm surprised more than like 15 people even saw it. But that's the algorithm and talking about terrible shows. Those two things are hand in hand. How to be uncreative 101, give the dwarf character a hammer. How to be uncreative 101, again, give the elf a bow. It's like, were they even trying? Anyone who watches this should be like, are you questioning my intelligence? Like as an audience member, as adults who should be probably watching this show, you're actually questioning my intelligence. You're giving the dwarf a hammer and the elf a bow and the girl with the witch hat magic. This is episode 3 in, and by this point, if you're not insulted that High Guardian Spice thinks you're an idiot, then you should be. <laughs> Welcome to episode 3, by the way. Transformations, written by Kate Leth, hashtag kill all men. Oh look at that, the idiot Rosemary somehow slips the sword out of her hand and breaks the sword. Sword's not broken, I'm just gonna spoil the episode. The sword's not broken, it was always broken. The mom broke it, it was fixed with magic some time ago. Literally this episode is a big, 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 big waste of time. There's only one or maybe two things to mention. This overview will be very quick. I just wanna use a thing like from Demon Slayer. Let's use Demon Slayer, it's a very good example. Tanjiro, for example, you see him practicing with his sword or characters make remarks about his hands look like the hands of a person who's been handling a sword for a very long time who has been avidly training a lot with his sword the fact that rosemary is here and that she was entrusted to this sword like how much did she actually swing it around how much was she using it for when we see a flashback of her getting the sword she looks fairly young i can only assume she was young when she got this sword and she's been training with it ever since at least to swing it around like she does now right but if i could give them praise it is that they're at least consistent that she breaks shit very often i grew up watching my mother use her body to pull magic from the earth it drains you it's like there's always a cost but this new magic is so different this new magic stuff there is no cost they can just do things cut their hair fly around the world. We're hinted that new magic is pretty much magic without cost. We can assume magic, old magic, is like alchemy. There needs to be some sort of equivalent exchange if I were to ex use the words of uh, FMA. But new magic has no cost to it. Of course, this might not truly be the case, as it's hinted on later on in the series, new magic might come at a cost, but not just one you can see, AKA pollution. Is, is that your sister? It's me, actually. You are a girl? <laughs> I'm transgender. Welcome to the worst scene in a cartoon I have ever seen. Genuinely, I think I despise this scene. I'll explain in a second, but I want you to watch it through. Just watch this part through. I'm transgender. I don't know that word. I was born into a female body, but it wasn't the right body for me. So I used new magic to change it. Cool, you can do that? I is that kind of transformation magic permanent? I take a potion once a month to keep the spell active, which lets me be the real me. Oh, I'd give anything to know where she is right now. Why in the world would a world of magic have the word transgender? Why would it exist in this world? Anyone, anyone, raise your hand and tell me why that would exist. No hands? Sounds stupid? Yeah, it is stupid. Again, this character is voiced by Ray Rodriguez, so it is the ultimate projection. At this point, I don't even want to call it possibly projection. I think it's just projection in general. I think projection can be done right, but this is definitely every single way to do it wrong. This was something I just wanted to go on about because the show itself can be a little preachy. And what is preaching in writing? It's having your characters deliver your social, religious, political beliefs, or theories. The general rule for preachy dialogue 
They say fiction is not the place to preach. If a character has a position to defend, let them do it. Remember that your position has no place in that character's mouth. Characters need to be characters, not your ideal mini-me. And that's what Caraway is. Caraway is just the ideal version of Ray Rodriguez. Caraway is powerful, cool, collected, a hero for all intents and purposes. And the general issue with this I'm transgender line is that Rosemary immediately throws it away like it didn't even matter to her. Because it didn't. It didn't matter to her. So it made no sense to add it there. The script is so self-indulgent that it can't even hold back such a scene. A scene that meant nothing. It meant nothing towards this character at this particular moment. They had to add it for whatever reason. It fits later on down the series, but here it makes no sense. So we can only assume that this is a transformation magic, but even then, it's so on your nose when Caraway says, I have to take a potion once a month. It almost sounds like maybe hormones, something like that. I'm transgender. Kill me. Most adults, especially if they're paying for Crunchyroll, should know what a transgender is. And if they don't, they should be able to figure it out themselves. The side B plot, well actually there's like three plot lines in this whole episode. Uh, one of them is Nappy Cat, who is a cat with a mission, who is the, another one of the best characters. He's dynamic, he's cool, the voice actor does a great job. The Nappy Cat side plot plays out a little later in the series though. So for now, he's just an enjoyable character. We also see our first moment of like actual gore in the show, like blood. It's, it's done poorly, of course, uh, because they obviously don't know how to handle it, because the first two episodes had none of it. But I want you to remember that they're killing this beast. This will be important later on again. A lot of things are important later on. It's almost like the first few episodes are a waste of time. Maybe. 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 At the very end of the episode, we're introduced to the rot as a byproduct, most likely, of new magic by some some means. At least that's what we have to assume. The rot is linked towards time's core conflict. This will be touched upon later on. No shit, Sherlock. Episode four, past present, written by Kate Left. Hashtag kill all men. Not sorry about it. <whistles> episode four is a giant waste of time. Don't watch it. I think. <laughs> I keep saying every episode is worse than the next, but I really genuinely feel that way. So for another contrived reason, there's a bunch of whatever, there's an infestation and the characters have to leave. And because they have to leave, we spend time outside of the school, even though we really just got here, to have a moment with the characters and their mothers. Each of the characters, except for Rosemary, uh, has a conflict with their mother. All of the conflicts are solved easily and within the episode with literally no pushback from the parent. If there is pushback, it's minimal at best because at the end of the day, they're like, okay, daughter, and that's it. I'll just run through it really, really quick because I feel like episode four is, again, a giant waste of time. If you're going to have character conflict, make it meaningful. We're introduced to Parsley's family. Parsley has a huge family. She wants to pretty much go to school. Her mom and dad want her to stay with her. Her dad's really adamant about staying there, helping with the family, even though dad has not mastered the pullout method at all. And so he's an irresponsible, he's reckless, and he's ruining his wife. He keeps having kids with her consistently, even though it's causing them problems. And it's causing his older daughter to be unhappy. It's just, we're wondering if you've got it out of your system yet. Got what out of my system? School? We're sure it's interesting there, but we want what's best for the family, and it's a lot of work here for just your father and I. So, if you're done trying it out, we're ready for you to come back. So at this point, how is the dad nothing but an antagonist to his own daughter? And the daughter then says, I've been looking after my brothers my whole life, but I finally get this shot to make something of myself and you want me to leave? Just to come back here and... and what? End up like you? Oh. Parsley, you apologize to your mother this instant. Why? You have another girl now. Raise her to be the help. 
I don't want to end up like you, mom. And to me, I can only joke and be like, what? Just be a receptacle for dad when he wants to go at it? Like, is that what you mean? At no point do the parents be like, well, how dare you never come back or we will never forgive you. At the end, they forgive her and they let her go and do her own thing. You know, go back to school. Go, go do whatever you want. You know, when your father and I had you, we knew you'd be remarkable. Guess everyone's wrong once in a while. I was wrong, but not about you. You were so brave today. You saved your brother. I shouldn't have left in the first place. I don't think your father and I realized how much we rely on your help. But that's not your job. You've given us so much, and the least we can do is support you. Sage's conflict is that she has... She was given a new Terra Spear, which is new magic by her aunt. Is her aunt right? I honestly don't remember anymore. It doesn't matter. But she's given a new Terra Spear, which is contained with new magic. And they said, hey, do you like it? And she's like, no, of course she wouldn't because she's still apprehensive towards new magic, but also because the thing was freaking huge. <gasps> Good Look at that, Sage! Your own Terra Sphere! It's... Uh... <laughs> You just hold it like this. Oh, oh. Whoa, cool. mm. oh no, you hate it. We'll go first thing tomorrow and get you one that fits. Great! By the way, we get introduced to the best character, Slime Boy. <laughs> Who, I don't know if they just gave him a shitty mic or he was really phoning it in or he was just like, I don't care. You guys are only giving me $15 to say what? This stuff? Get out of here. I don't know what happened, but Slime Boy is, again, one, one of the best characters because he's, he's so poorly done. <laughs> They're like, no one said you want to do another take. Oh, she's out back. She's elbow deep in uh, turnips. Hey, Slime Boy. Oh, it's fine. We're in break. We, we got catapulted out because of a traveler infestation. You go to High Guardian? Yep, I am Slime Boy. <laughs> You're... You're what now? That's what everyone calls me. I, I kind of like it. Uh, you know, it's the same slime and then boy. Not a single person. And if this is the intentional performance, oh my god, it's genius, but ironically genius. Sage's conflict keeps going through because her mother is very conservative. By the way, new magic and old magic are also conservative and was that liberal or whatever? Uh, again, very, very, very subtle. We just wanted to help you with this huge, crazy shift. And look, if your mom gets mad, we'll take the fall. A bit hypocritical of her, though. Well, I mean, your mom wasn't always so conservative. Hold on. Anise, sweetheart, your mom went through a phase where she really dug new magic. I know, right? Thank you, High Guardian Spice. Really, thank you. So her mother was conservative. She didn't want her daughter getting into it. Now this is why the mother was very important because why would the mother then send her daughter off to a school and do no research about like, oh, they're studying a lot of new magic there or whatever. Like how's the mother so outdated with her information? It then makes even less sense because the mother was into new magic back in the day. Now Sage's conflict is pretty much out the window. She doesn't want to try new magic because her mother, who taught her to be into the ways of old magic, would be against it. And that's like her main conflict because she grew up a certain way. This is like growing up in a certain type of household and believing certain things. A person of a different lifestyle comes around, they want you to accept that life or integrate with it, and you're just being conflicted over this, right? Sage grew up being trained old magic. She gets justified in using new magic because her mom is a bit of a hypocrite. So Sage's general character conflict is out the window. It means nothing now. And so now how do we paint Sage's mother who sent her daughter off gleefully to this new school of new and old magic, yet she instilled fear of using new magic into her daughter? Why is there no mention of this before they even get to the school? We just think she likes old magic because that's all they taught her there. But instead, it's more of an internalized fear of using it because her mother taught her that. 
Yet the creators just want to whisk it away saying she's just a hypocrite because this is an easy way to shame conservatives. Again, the show comes off as preachy. Listen, mom, it's all right. I get it. Get what? I can't say two words to you without you interrupting me. I know it's not easy for us right now. Mom! Maybe the next time school's out, you'll come see me. Time's conflict is with her mother. Her and her mother are crossed in ways. They don't agree with a certain thing which happened back home. Time wants to find her father and her mother isn't specifically on board with that. Her mother just gives up. She literally says, all right, that's it, bye, and walks away. Time gets to get yell at her and everything. Now the single one of the mothers in this episode reprimand their daughter. Everyone's relationship carries on the same way it was before. With the exception of Sage, because Sage literally can't interact with her mother now. Episode 5, not written finally by Kate Leth, Kill All White Men. I'm sorry, not White Men. Pretty sure she feels that way though. By Katie McVeigh. Now, the episode starts off with Sage practicing new magic. Pretty excessively, too, by the way. Like, she goes full on. This then leads us to our first scene. We have another classroom thing with this crazy ass teacher. <laughs> who again brings a deadly situation to the students. Again, no one dies. The teacher then tries to convince, well not even the teacher, like most of the class tries to convince Sage of using new magic in order to accomplish the task. Is it okay if I use old magic? Sage, why crawl through the desert delirious with thirst when you can summon an oasis of sparkling water in any flavor you choose? New magic doesn't require the hours of ritual, the reckoning, the effort. Basically, old magic is dumb. But new magic multiplies your power and lets you do what you want. With new magic, you can do anything. <laughs> Huh? Guess this one's out of juice. Amaryllis disparages old magic. The teacher provides example of why new magic is so great. Even to show us the fact that Terra Spheres just run out of juice. So they're like batteries maybe? Who knows? My mother taught me that as magic gives to you, you must give to it. Or the balance will be destroyed. Balance schmalance! You've got a Terrasphere now, haven't you? I... I mean, yes. But the history of Guardians demonstrates that those who don't adapt are doomed to obsolescence. The Sage has a more naturalistic approach to it, as magic as a, a living being, a system that we need to care and nurture for. There's a B-plot with Rosemary Parsley and Snapdragon. It's not as important as the like major plot. Like, this is the second time in a row we have a sage and old magic and new magic conflict. And yet, she does nothing. Nothing to show us the merit of old magic besides saying that it's good. Or, I have to do it this way. There's no merit. Every character that brings her a point of, this is why new magic is better, she just says, well, old magic. That's it. I mentioned earlier that new magic most likely is like pollution. Because you don't take back from nature and then give back with magic, that it most likely has some sort of waste to it. But as far as we know, there's, there's literally no drawback to new magic at all. It just seems to be a learning curve for Sage. But begs the question, how did she not know new magic was going to be dominant in this school? How did these girls get accepted to a school with solely old magic when everyone else, all of the other students, use new magic? At least the ones who are going to be like sorcerers or magicians, whatever. All of them use new magic. Well, sorry, he's been eating my shoes. Uh-huh. Greg is very supportive. Whenever I study geography, Greg is there, also being bad at geography. Parnell is also a very good character because his, his dialogue is just absolutely insane. Too bad he has a, like very little scenes. 
and very little importance. We essentially waste a lot of time just walking around the school and playing around with magic. And to the point where Sage doesn't even attempt to go back to old magic or even practice that or try to mix both of them. She's just immediately just throwing around new magic as much as possible in this episode near the later half. To the point being like, why was there even major conflict in the beginning at all? Stop! That's the infinite hallway. What? What? <gasps> infinite hallway? <laughs> the infinite hallway at least sounds exciting. We have another throwaway scene, legitimately pointless. The infinite hallway. It means nothing. The school itself has no mystery or intrigue because they don't really explore the school at all except for like this episode. This is the only episode they actually walk around the school. Uh, which at this point the idea should have been either we focus on Sage's conflict or we expand the lore in the world of the school. Spoiler alert, it won't matter if the school gets burned down anyway. The characters finally get towards the room where Sage is hiding at, practicing magic, and they just banter. At the end, Sage just fixes the problem by herself, even though she was like, you should help me. Wow. You can do this. Really? I have an idea. Hmm, why doesn't your best friend Amaryllis fix this? This isn't my problem. I'm sorry. Sage, you can do this. Time is right, Sage! You can do this! At the end, she just does it. <laughs> and like that, conflict resolves. No negative aftermath at all. Crushing Obstacles, episode 5? Are we on 5 now? 4? I don't know anymore. I'm lost. I've been watching this for a long time now. Regardless, Kate Leth is here. Hashtag kill all man. We're introduced to a new character, Aster, who is, I guess, toxic masculinity, except the writers just wrote him as a standard asshole and with no redeeming factors at all. You can truly tell it's an all-female writing staff, especially with Kate Leth, kill all men. Hashtag. But a positive to the episode, because I, I will point out some positives, uh, because Snapdragon and Amaryllis are the best characters of the show. I might have said I liked Parnell and Slime Boy, but those are because they're meme worthy. Amaryllis and Snapdragon are truly the best characters in the whole show. So the fact where them as protagonists is far more interesting than the four protagonists we have, these two characters alone. Snapdragon himself is fighting. He has a conflict with his own identity. By far, he is the more intriguing character, more fleshed out and more complex. Amaryllis has a bit more of an easier conflict. Really, it's just being less of an asshole. Alongside that, gaining empathy, as that's the one thing she doesn't have, at least in the beginning. And these two characters are handled fairly well enough. By no means great or good, Again, we've seen these kind of things before, especially from like anime. You know, you'll have like uh, Boku girls in anime, uh, girls who use the term Boku, which is normally masculine and they'll call themselves men. These have already been done before. Where Snapdragon heads in his character arc, who knows? But by far, is his conflict more engaging than the others, even though like the idea of finding your mother is genuinely more high stakes. The Aster side plot itself is about Rosemary being in, you know, your regular schoolgirl crush with Aster, because he's Mr. Handsome. And this crush ends up being a conflict for Sage as she's always with Rosemary. She's always interacting with her. So her having her time with someone else is new to her. A simple conflict, but one that gets his point across very easily. And because of this conflict, she ends up becoming more friendlier with Snapdragon. Amarilla still being the best character. Touche. Huh? <laughs> Isn't that dangerous? Just touching someone with a sharp weapon. Rapiers are, are sharp, aren't they? I'm pretty sure they are. I feel like that was the most like fake anime thing I've ever seen. 
Part of me is undecided if they're trying to push like Snapdragon being in love or infatuated with Sage. Because he's obviously not infatuated with uh, Amaryllis at all. Since he deals with Ginger Dysphoria and later on we'll see he might even want to be just like Professor Carraway. Uh, it could lead towards a lesbian relationship or, or whatever like that. It seems like it's setting up that way and to be honest I wouldn't be surprised if I just called it now. Rosemary and I? We've been best friends for pretty much ever. I understand friendship. Guy friendship is different. It isn't the same. Guys don't talk about their feelings. Let's just focus on the task. I do like the moment where Sage is saying that you wouldn't understand friendship between women to Snapdragon. And he obviously gets upset about that because it's just friendship, right? Like it's just the concept of friendship, but she's belittling him in this sense. And him pushing back is a good thing. It's a good conflict between the two characters. Is it long lived? No. Just like every other conflict in this show, it is short lived. I don't mess with that shit. This is for trapping me, you bastard! Let's go smash shit till you feel better. Love to waste my damn- Don't be surprised when you fall on your ass with that attitude. Fine, but this is grog shit and you know it! Let me catch this asshole. One of the few times they start cursing in the show, I think I missed one of them. Again, we're a few episodes in and they only curse like every so often. Very little. And so it makes no sense why we even have a content warning about foul language. Is it solely because it's in English? And that we can understand it? But like, characters say kso and shimatta, bakatare, and stuff like that all the time in anime, and those are some pretty bad things. Like, Tokyo Revengers, the characters curse quite a bit. It doesn't make a lot of sense why we would get a content warning about foul language when it was like the bare minimum. PG-13 stuff at best. If it was like really, really more than that, they could have toned down the language. Wait, do you mean affairs like the business stuff she does? Or do you mean- Oh, <laughs> she's a lush who never met a deckhand she didn't deck with her hands. <laughs> she's a human shipwreck. What the hell is up with this show? It wants to play all fields, but it certainly can't. You can't have a line like that and then have borderline children dialogue in every other episode. It makes very little sense. Choose a lane and actually stay in it. Here, it just makes it seem like a jumbled mess. <laughs> uh, wait, did you mean affairs like- Yeah, I meant the other thing. Oh, okay. Ugh. This maze is terrible. Yep. Just like people. <laughs> yeah, well, we got that in common too. And then look how fast it's dropped. Immediately, it's just dropped. Just like everything else. Like at this point, then you cut to a different character. But no, then they just mention something totally different. It's very jarring dialogue. I, I totally forgot to mention they were playing stupid schoolyard games, even though they were apparently life and death games. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, Parnell won because they had to give it to him because Aster is a toxic male and they had to teach him a lesson. <laughs> How terrible is this? It's so stupid. But then we get this this horrifying scene. You What were they thinking? <laughs> what were they thinking? Next episode, The Cave of Vinca. Written by Katie McVeigh. No Kate left, kill all men. Hashtag. Are they sharing or trying to scare us? That cave has barely swallowed up a bushel of kids. There's your answer. Uh, a bushel? I wish they'd tell us what our mission was before we got there. I like being surprised. I like being prepared. Good luck, darlings! If you die in there, I'm keeping your stuff! That's right, Zinnia. The cave's a real death trap. You've heard the legends. All of Redbug's clothes are from students who plunge to their deaths. <laughs> How is this supposed to weed out the weak ones? They're all a big old herd of cowards. They're scared because the cave is miles deep, and monsters have risen from the depths. The mission is meant to challenge them, but it also forces them to challenge themselves. Well, they get their first mission, they go into the cave. This was hinted at like two episodes or so ago. And the townsfolk are saying, you're gonna die out there. And these kids are still taking it like it's a joke. Even though it's up to the teachers to teach them that, yeah, you're going to actually die out there. Everyone else is pretty much treated like a joke. 
So now you have a bunch of characters who are like, we're not going to die out there. And there's only one character in this crowd who's like, guys, we should actually be worried about this. And it's this blonde character. And to this point, I'm like, how did she make it this far in? These teachers are so incompetent, so incapable that they send students out to their death. Apparently, I mean, the story in story, or I should say from the writing, no one dies. We're just told people die. Uh, the townsfolk believe it. The teachers are saying it, so we have to assume people normally die in this kind of situation. So if that's the case, why are your teachers sending out children who should be on like easier missions or chaperoned towards these missions to die? This is how you train guardians? How are there guardians in the first place if you keep sending them on suicide missions? If your courage fails you, you will forfeit your guardianship. You mean we'll be expelled? Oh yes, immediate expulsion. I am very proud of this class, and I fully expect a good number of you to live. Immediately they're told if you run away, then you don't get to be a guardian. Which, fair enough if you run from battle. At this point, this is their first mission of do or die. Nothing has prepared them to this point. By that, I mean nothing in the show was shown that they were going to face a mission where they could just die out of nowhere never before in the show. Besides the one teacher that tries to kill her students every single time, none of the other teachers have taught them anything like this. What does the ethics teacher have to tell you about this? If you die in a cave alone, well, I guess you forfeit being a hero. Is that ethical? Not to train people to become better heroes? Maybe running away and having another soldier is better than having a dead soldier, right? So now, High Guardian Academy comes off as an incompetent facility filled with incompetent staff that let children run to their death with no chaperone, no way of monitoring them at all. Now luckily for the show, the show is zero stakes, so no one actually dies. People can get hurt, but no one dies. All this complaining is for nothing because everyone comes out scot-free, luckily, but like, that's what I'm saying, the premise itself is lying to the show, it's lying to the audience. This is dangerous, no one dies, so it's not dangerous. A character getting hurt isn't dangerous. People get hurt all the time. Remember, when you see the walls fall in and your Enough! throat close. None of us should be going in there. Why would any of you choose to walk into this nightmare? Um, because we want to be guardians. So we have Xenia, the only character who thinks rationally about this whole situation. But at the same time, it makes me think that these kids, none of the students were prepared for this at all. The responsibility of a teacher is to teach a student the thing they need to do to pass their next test or the thing they need to do to pass their curriculum whatever you want to say and so Xenia here was given none of the skills at all none of the skills information to pass this test or even confront it instead you have your teacher howling like an idiot and scaring the kids and them all laughing it off even though multiple times in episode they say you're going to die here Either the creators want us to take the show seriously or they don't. And most likely they don't because the lack of conflict and the lack of high stakes is apparent that they don't want people to take it seriously at all. It's a lighthearted show even though they want to have risk and consequences but not actually follow through. It's filled with stupid stuff from point A to point B. Students, your mission is to collect a vial of magical healing waters. These maps show the caves and corridors down to level three, where you will find the spring of healing waters. There are- They are out here to get this magical healing thing, which uh, coincidentally matches with Time's objective, her motive, uh, which is to heal the fairy woods which her father resides in. But the teachers then say that proceeding further to level 3 is beyond the teachings. The first girl, Xenia, ran away before even entering the cave. That means you probably didn't teach them anything. But luckily the girls stumble their way to find the healing bowl, but it's empty. And then they're attacked by monsters. During this conflict, Rose is hurt. She's injured, she gets her side cut. Even though, at the end, it means nothing. From here, the audience can already believe that Rosemary will not die from anything. Uh, the protagonist won't die at all. Uh, no one has been hurt at all until this point, but there is no reason to believe that she will die or have any real serious injury for the rest of the show. 
I want to also add to this that they kill these monsters freely. Like, they have no inhibitions about killing these creatures at all. Again, this will play a little later. You'll see. Because it's all building up. All of this is building up to one pivotal moment. And then somehow these girls were able, they were the only people able to figure out the riddles presented to them by these goblins or whatever the hell they are. They're the only ones, the only ones to be able to figure it out. They're given the MacGuffin button, uh, I mean an egg as well in order to, you know, solve the next future problem that's going to happen. They get to the spring of healing, they give Rose the healing water, she heals instantly. So at this point it's like, well, what the hell was the point of even worrying? It was nothing to stop them from getting the water. They get the water first and are able to heal Rose at that moment. Right afterwards, they're attacked by these two giant golems in probably one of the worst choreographed fights I've seen in a cartoon. I think even X-Arm probably has better fight sequences than this. It's, it's terrible. It's literal Scooby-Doo levels of nonsense. Having both of the golems run at each other, crash and crack each other. Scooby-Doo level. Come on. After that, the girls get stuck in the chamber with the healing water, and this is a great time for them just to start talking exposition. This is probably one of the most egregious exposition dumps of all time because it, it serves no purpose outside of that we didn't have anything else planned to organically get the girls outside of the cave. Only through this exposition are we given Time's central conflict about her father. This gets to end with Time getting a good old hug segment for her sob story. It's not a bad one, it's just is just not interesting. There's the rot and the rot is rotting the fairy forest and her dad decided to stay. And that's really it. But because her character isn't so happy-go-lucky and she's a bit more cynical compared to everyone else who is way more happy-go-lucky than her, she comes off as a better written character. Time has more agency with her goal than every other character. She wants the healing water to heal the forest, to heal the rot, at least to see if it can heal the rot and the tree next to the school. And if that's the case, then she can keep going forward with this plan and try to help her father out. She is so much more proactive when it comes to getting to her motive, to achieving her goal. And so that egg I mentioned, the MacGuffin button, Parsley again has to give us stupid exposition saying that's a dragon egg. Because of course, only Parsley would know that's a dragon egg. <laughs> so now you have to think to yourself, why did you waste so much time doing that truth or dare segment, just giving out exposition, and then finally, the only reason they existed was to give Time's backstory and her goal and her motivation. Because at the end of the day, this was the moment they were trying to build up to. After Time's segment, you just cut straight to a different conversation again. And that's what I mean. This show is jumbled apart pieces of a script and they're like, how do we connect this one to this one? And they have no connection point. Nothing smooth to connect the, the scenes together. At this point, we could have explored what the other students were doing because none of them died, by the way. Not a single student is dead and we don't hear about a single student dying either. So they throw the dragon egg into the healing water because this healing water accelerates things as well and the dragon is fully grown and he takes them across the land or whatever. At the end of the day, it's a non-conflict again. They get to the school. Finally, at the end of the episode, we come to the realization that the healing water can indeed affect the rot. Maybe not clear it 100%, but it is indeed a way for a time to help her father. that the elf girl and her minions are closing in on the secrets of witch country. Yes. Kill them. I don't feel comfortable escalating things to that level with anyone. And this far in, this far in, we're finally introduced to an actual antagonist, Olive. The cat we saw in episode two that was staring at time, there you go. She should have been introduced way earlier because having an antagonistic force is very important, especially for a show like this. Because these first six episodes, we spent all of the time doing relatively nothing. And these last six episodes, starting from this one on, are the biggest part of the story. First six are essentially filler, with the first one being actual filler. In the later half of the series, having a 180 when it comes to tone. Establishing an antagonist, something they should have done at least by episode 2 or 3. It's like, a, it's like a cardinal sin, there's no antagonist at all, at least present, until now? 
Olive is shown talking to a mysterious flame guy and she mentions which country, uh, which now we can assume is an evil country. <laughs> because they're a witch, I guess, I don't know. But we do know because, again, subtlety, the person she's talking to is super evil because he has very slanted eyes and jack-o'-lantern type of mouth. And I'll just make a little quick aside here, but Olive's design, I really like it, at least her face. I like her face a lot and her hair. I think it's really cool. Uh, probably the best designed character so far of this show. She kind of gives me like a Tokyo Mew Mew kind of vibe. Again, very, very old anime. So I'm assuming the people who wrote this show are as old as me, if not a little older. But unfortunately, our first antagonist is against killing, even though she's come here from a country or an association who isn't against killing. She would, she should have known by the very least her superiors would say kill someone. Now join me aspiring writers or those who just want to watch the train wreck. I'm going to give my reasons to why I think High Ghania Spice is contrived. Otherwise what I like to call lazy writing. By nature all stories are contrived since they are artificial. And so I would like to recontextualize the word contrived as the hand of the author. Anything that makes the audience aware of the hand of the author is going to break their immersion in the story. The writer is standing behind a curtain, tossing rude notes at you and congratulating themselves when you get upset. This is nothing new, you might have heard this term before. This is the notion that once you notice the author's intent, you can never ignore it. You will always see when the author is making an obvious choice, such as the I'm, I'm transgender, transgender line. It's very obvious the intent of the author when that scene comes up. It's jarring. It makes no sense to be there. So the only reason it could possibly be there is because the author wanted it to be there. All stories are journeys. At the end of the day, we know that our protagonist will win and they'll save the day. Rose will find her mom. Maybe it won't end the same way we think it will, but she'll find her mom and most likely she won't die. Seeing how the story is now, there is no risk at all. So what matters is the journey getting there. And contrived writing is like taking shortcuts from that journey. We should be able to sightsee, we should be able to see the world, see the characters, all of that is a city that you can see. We're driving through a vast metropolitan city, seeing all the little details here and there sprinkled forth. But when your writing is contrived and lazy, I'm just going to call it lazy from now on, it's like taking the freeway and skipping all of it. And this is what High Guardian Spice does. It creates scenes only to set up other scenes in the most obvious way. Its intent is not well hidden. And then between those scenes, it either does not have the control, the directing, to switch to another scene that adds more importance, but rather High Guardian Spice adds scenes of no meaning at all. We're going to use episode 3, and we'll, we'll go through the episodes as we talk about this. I think episode 3 is like the best example solely because of the I'm transgender scene. Ray Rodriguez or any of the writers added in there because they wanted to. Uh, I called it at the time self-indulgent. So we break down that episode scenes into like simple concepts like one sentence long. We can now see how contrived the writing is that led us to that I'm transgender. Rose breaks her sword. Caraway happens to be around in order to see her break her sword. Caraway knows that the sword is broken. This allows Caraway to give her exposition about her mother. Which is all fair and fine enough, but it's very obvious she broke the sword or the sword was broken at that moment just to give this exposition. Again, you have to be very careful about adding exposition to your story and how it's added and when it's added. The transition between one scene to another is very important. Is there an organic way for Kaway to have seen her break the sword or an organic way for her to get the information of her mother from Caraway? I'm sure there is. And we'll talk about that in a future video. I want to do a rewrite of the all of High Guardian Spice. It should be maybe 30 minutes long, I'm hoping. But knowing me, it'll be longer. But anyway, because Caraway gives this exposition, then he can give meaningless exposition about himself to a character who doesn't care about him, the I'm transgender scene. But throughout the whole episode are sprinkled in things of Arsley and her use every tool which doesn't play at all into anything else in the future. Why was it added? Because they simply needed filler. I think I was saying Nappy Cat the whole time, but I think it's Neppy Cat. Neppy Cat was only introduced to introduce the rot. Yet, yeah, is there not a better way to introduce that? Episode 4. Arsley wants to go to school. Why? For whatever reason, because she doesn't earn anything in story. The writers don't give her anything to work with, but she wants to stay in school. Her parents don't want her to. In the episode, Parsi saves one of her brothers from falling. 
and the parents acknowledge that, oh my god, school is good for you. Despite the fact that Parsi's parents already rely on her to take care of her brothers. That means if she's not around, what happens when trouble arrives with their brothers? If they're in a dangerous situation, do the parents just not do anything about it? Have they always relied on Parsley for this? And if that's the case, her saving one brother one time shouldn't make any sense. I mean, she's always been helping them. And the only reason the brother got in trouble is because Time and her mother are still not on friendly terms. So this is the best way to get Time and her mother to work together in order to make up in some semblance of a way. They still end up parting ways at the end of the episode, not really sharing any sort of comfort to each other, which is good in itself. The brother only got in trouble because they needed Time and her mother to work together. And this is why I say this is just a children's show. This is stuff children would be able to read into, like after thinking about it really, really, really hard. But as adults, who they have a content warning for, that's the main issue, is that this is being sold to people who are older than like 10 years old, but the writing is like for 10 year olds. Sage's apprehension towards new magic solely exists just to half-heartedly shame conservatives. The whole time, Sage, if you think of her as an old magic person, and old magic is conservative, then when we see what she goes through in story, being questioned if she's in love with Rosemary, possibly being in love or infatuated with Snapdragon, who wants to be a woman as well, uh, so if they do transition in the future, that means there's a lesbian relationship. It, it's all just an allegory for her being conservative and then becoming more liberal. We have yet to see any real merit of old magic. The only time she does it is she saves her class, but it's totally skipped. We just see her messing with potions and then everyone is healed. Yet we also don't see her failing with old magic enough for her to really justify, I don't want to use it, but this has to work, this has to work. But all she does is say, old magic, old magic, old magic. And so this is only episode four, and we've only seen one act of old magic being useful. Yeah, the character wants to keep saying old magic is good, old magic is good, only to be provided why new magic is so much better, and then to be told by her own family, your mom was into new magic, and yeah, new magic is good. Like the conflict itself doesn't have enough power to it, and Sage is only set up to fail once in the whole series, only one time with her new magic, she's only set up to fail once. But for her to be at ways with this new style of living, there needs to be more failure on her end. Aster. Aster is toxic masculinity. All he is is just a pretty boy. He has no other merit to himself. Even though most people you probably disagree with or don't like are probably successful in some way. Whether it's the a-ho who gets all the girls, well, his merit is that he gets all the girls. There's something redeeming about him that makes them like him. But in this case, he's only created to infatuate Rose. That way, we have a character to pair Rose with. That way, the rest of the episode has content. And Rose and Sage can now be separated. Aster himself could have been introduced episodes ago. But no, he's only introduced in this episode and given reason in this episode never to be seen again. Episode 6, one of the worst ones because people think this episode has stakes to it. And that it actually leads to anything substantial. The girls are given the quest. The quest is obscured until we get to the cave. Why is it obscured? Because it leads into like all the other reasons the episode exists. Why this cave in general? Why do they have to do something so dangerous? Only because the healing water is here. Well, the healing water can heal the rot and because it can heal the rot, time wants it. But because this cave has healing water in it, Rosemary can get hurt, fatal wound, but because there's healing water, that means she can be healed, no consequences at all. Wouldn't it have been better if she had gotten hurt, maybe not a fatal injury, but gotten hurt or maybe even lost her sword, something that would have hurt her, physically, emotionally, anything. But at the end of the day, she just gets out scot-free because there's the healing water there. It will play later on where Sage will say, you're too reckless, Rosemary. It's also very convenient that the golems don't attack them while Rosemary is injured and when they take the healing water. Uh, the golems are very aware that they're there and the people if people are there that means they're going to take the healing water it doesn't mean they're just going to stop and look at it. it's not a tourist attraction it's a place where the healing water exists but of course we can't have anyone else get to the healing water so the girls are the only ones who get to the healing water which allows them to be the only ones stuck after they defeat the golems who happen to break down right in front of the cave door which allows us to have exposition about time but if we weren't in this area at all time would never have given her exposition about her father of course all media is artificial all of the scenes that we see 
deliver information that allows us to get to the next scene or allows us to have more context towards the next story point. But High Guardian Spice's writing is so obvious, so deliberate that it shows the author's hand. If you're looking to write a story, I think the best thing to do is to find a way not to create shortcuts for yourself that allow you to set up scenes easily. Don't create a healing water and that's the only time you seriously injure your characters. It's pretty simple stuff. Anyway, I think maybe one or two more episodes and we're done. Maybe the finale, like the final episode, will just be one episode on its own. I can cover the other, other five um in one episode as we go on the episodes will have more content to go through and more issues in general because everything else stated before doesn't play enough into the future episodes these episodes are a straight up waste of time you know the more i think about it the more it upsets me that crunchyroll gave this opportunity to a bunch of people who didn't deserve it i know that's kind of like how it works especially for like liberal media a lot of it is nepotism or people got in at the right time that kind of thing and they're not proven at all because this is a definitely unproven story the unproven work in general it doesn't deserve what it has um and there are so many other people who are more deserving of this of even like two to three episodes of their story and i want to keep going on i want this episode to end but i just find it very abhorrent we had a bunch of people out there saying we're for diversity yet their diverse writing staff is mainly filled with white women I'm not for just giving black people voices or giving Asian people voices because of their race or their identity, uh, but I feel like there are people that these people said they stand for who had better work than them. I can think of anything from Saturday AM that probably deserved an anime over these people. It's just frustrating to think about it. It's just really frustrating to think about like these are the people who get their shots. I understand it's just how the system goes, but it's a damn shame. I'll see you next episode.